Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 1st, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight. What would happen if the Patriot Act disappeared? Then, the truth about Dennis Hastert. And vaccines hurting children finally goes mainstream. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm correct. I'm vindicated. Where are the apologies? Where? Where are they? They're nowhere. And let me tell all the neocons and fake right-wingers and fake liberals. Rand Paul fired a very important shot across the bow of the surveillance state this weekend. He delayed the passage of the Patriot Act until it expired. Now, that's not going to stop them from spying, of course. They have violated the law for a very long time, going all the way back to the Frank Church uh, Committee hearings as well as the Pike Committee hearings in the House. We learned back in the 70s that the NSA was spying on our phone calls at that time. Of course, they didn't have the kind of technology to leverage at that time that made them so dangerous. It's very important that people wake up and it's very important to remove that legal cover. The next time you hear Marco Rubio or Lindsey Graham or Richard Burr brag about how we need to have this uh, surveillance state, fear mongering about how we need to have this surveillance state, remember the lies that we've been told by them, the lies that have been exposed. Now we played a couple of months ago a clip and analyzed Michael Hayden, the former NSA director, talking to students at Washington and Lee University and essentially kind of going on a supervillain monologue. Here's a little bit of that clip. A lot of commentary was made about Jim Clapper and the question from Juan Wyden on, the, on that, you know, about mass bulk collection and so on. Jim's answer was horrible, all right? And Jim's, Jim's an honest guy. He just, he just hosed it horribly. Yeah, he lied. Let's continue. <laughs> he hosed it because he flat out lied under oath. But of course, if you're part of the intelligence community, you won't go to jail for lying under oath. Jim's answer was not as bad as Ron Wyden's question. Oh, it's the question that's the problem. I don't really know what a dossier is in this context. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. Everyone on that dais knew the correct answer to that question. Everyone behind everyone on that dais, the staffers, knew the answer to that question. They all knew the 215 program. Ron Wyden was trying to trick Jim Clapper into making an admission of classified information that Ron Wyden didn't have the courage to make himself. Okay, so he says that all the senators, all their staffers knew that the 215 program was being abused. And I agree with him. Ron Wyden should have come out and said it. But I think it's a bit more interesting to hear the head of the NSA lie to Congress, lie to the American people. The whole program is a lie. The way that they're using the 215 section that they were given under the Patriot Act even if that were constitutional, they're still exceeding their authority because that was supposed to be going after people that essentially you could get a search warrant for. Although you didn't have to go before a real judge, you just had to go before the FISA judge. But listen to what else he has to say. Why was Wyden trying to get Clapper to say what he was saying? Because Wyden in the committee was losing the vote on 215 consistently 15 to 2. So you put those two clips together and you understand that all the senators knew what was going on that were in the Senate Intelligence Committee. They knew that 215 was being abused, that they were going beyond their legal authority, which went beyond their constitutional authority. Their staffers knew. And Ron Wyden could not get them to do the right thing. 15 to 2, they were going to allow this continued abuse by the intelligence community. That's what he's saying. He's really making a case for how corrupt the Senate is. And it's gotten even worse. Ron Wyden is no longer there. And now we have Senator Burr from North Carolina who says he doesn't think there should be any public oversight of anything the intelligence community does. Listen to this last clip here. Oh, your talk today about 215? 215. 
215 is such a safe haven. 215 is legislated by Congress. I was doing metadata collection under the President's raw Article 2 authorities from October 7, 2001 forward. Catch that? Look at the smug expression on his face. He's so happy. He didn't need any 215. I don't need no stinking law. I'm a law unto myself. I take orders directly from the president. Or maybe he gives orders directly to the president. Who knows? They do whatever they wish. He doesn't need the 215. He doesn't need a law from Congress. He doesn't need the Patriot Act. And he could care less about the Constitution. Listen to what else he has to say. The 215 program doesn't begin with the Patriot Act. It begins with the private order I got from President Bush. And we decided it was lawful and consistent with the president's authorities as commander in chief. Yeah, we decided what the law is. They did it in secret. And of course, you're not going to be allowed to know anything that he does because that would hurt his effectiveness. So remember that when you hear them tell you that we have to have this or we're going to have terrorist attacks. They were lying about it then. And you, as you saw in that clip, Michael Hayden says, how dare Ron Wyden force James Clapper to lie in front of everybody. Ron Wyden, he said, knew what was going on. All the staffers knew what was going on. All the other senators knew what was going on. And he did that because they were all on board with the lies that the NSA is telling you. But of course, now they're going to tell you to watch your back. We're at the mercy of the terrorists. We're at the mercy of the boogeyman. Understand the biggest conspiracy theorists, the biggest fear mongers are the conservatives who support the surveillance state. But look at some of the uh, uh, jokes that people have made about this, because it really is a joke. We have an article up on Infowars.com. What will happen if the Patriot Act expires? We'll take a look at some of these cartoons. Of course, you're going to have uh, the ISIS flag flying over the White House. You're going to have the Death Star cut loose on the U.S., on the entire world. Uh, you've got a shot there from Independence Day where the uh, lightning beam comes down just before the White House itself explodes. And then my favorite, You've got the uh, zombie, the giant zombie, bin Laden, will rise from the dead and will terrorize America. Yeah. And you know what? That's not that much of an exaggeration from what they are telling us. Rand Paul put it this way. People here in town think I'm making a huge mistake. Some of them, I think, secretly want there to be an attack on the United States so they can blame it on me. One of the people in the media the other day came up to me and said, Oh, well, when there's a great attack, aren't you going to feel guilty that you caused this great attack? And it's like the people who attack us are responsible for attacks on us. Do we blame the police chief for the attack of the Boston bombers? The thing is, is that there can be attacks even if we use the Constitution, but there have been attacks while collecting your bulk data. So the ones who say, well, when an attack occurs, it's going to be all your fault, are any of them willing to accept the blame? We have bulk collection now. Are any of them willing to accept the blame for the Boston bombing, for the recent shooting in Garland? No, but they'll be the first to point fingers and say, oh, yeah, it's all your fault. We never should have given up on this great program. I'm completely convinced that we can open the Constitution use the Fourth Amendment as intended, spirit and letter of the law, and catch terrorists. So you remember that in spite of these Michael Hayden confessions, in spite of the revelations from Edward Snowden, in spite of the fact that we had conservatives wringing their hands after the Snowden revelation saying, now all of our enemies know exactly what we're doing, now the tack that they're taking two years on is just to boldly lie about it as if they were Bill Clinton caught red-handed in an affair. And of course, one of the lead players is one of the guys running for president, Marco Rubio. Here's Jakari Jackson's report on that. The perception has been created, including by political figures that serve in this chamber, that the United States government is listening to your phone calls or going through your bills on a, as a matter of course. That is absolutely categorically false. The next time that any politician, senator, congressman, talking head, whatever it may be, stands up and says that the U.S. government is listening to your phone calls or going through your phone records, they're lying. It just is not true. Except for some very isolated instances in the hundreds of individuals for whom there is reasonable suspicion that they could have links to terrorism. That was Senator Marco Rubio trying to assure you that nobody is monitoring your activities and anybody who tells you otherwise is being untruthful. 
While I'm very curious if Mr. Rubio knows about the remarks of the former CIA chief in Wired magazine bragging about how they'll spy on you through your dishwasher. And I'll be the first person to tell you, I don't believe everything that comes out of the CIA, but I can believe this because it wasn't something that they got caught doing and had to own up to it. It was something that they were bragging about and actually very proud of. Yes, there are uh, people who do terrorist activities who are being monitored, but plenty of everyday people as well. And I'm limiting my list of examples to a few. There are plenty other ones that you guys can easily find on the internet. Just look into, uh, there's actually a movie that came out, Terms and Conditions May Apply, where there's a gentleman, I believe he was a writer for CSI or uh, one of those crime stories or crime shows, and he was doing searches on how to murder somebody and get away with it, and somebody shows up to his house, so you're trying to kill your wife, this, is, this really happened, and that's just one example. But now let's talk about things that happened around the Boston bombing. We'll start with this clip. Anyway, now I guess it was a voicemail. They could they could try to get the, the phone companies to give that up at this point. But if it's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually can find out what happened, right? Unless she tells them. No, there is a way. They, we certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. The point I'm trying to make with this clip is that these guys had their conversations recorded before they were listed as suspects. It's not just the Tsarnaev brothers, it's you as well. And anybody said, well, I don't care about that because they're guilty of sin or whatever else. Well, how about this lady? This is a woman in Long Island. Her family had a visit by police officers because after the Boston bombing, they just happened to be searching for pressure cookers and backpacks. And then John Law came and knocked on their door. Once again, these people were no official suspects in any crime, which means people were monitoring their activities. And that's just one example. So with that being said, any of these guys who are trying to convince you, including Marco Rubio, that nobody is monitoring your telephone conversations or your Internet traffic or looking at the things on your phone, if they wanted to, could they do that? Absolutely. Keep that in mind as things go forward and you can find more reports on the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. <laughs> So in spite of the fact that they've been doing dragnet surveillance, they haven't been able to prevent something like the Boston bombing. And of course, all of the so-called terrorist events that they have stopped have essentially been created by the FBI. Nevertheless, when we come back from break, we're going to look at something that would really protect you that they want to keep secret. Of course, our government is now removing data that shows how people have been harmed by vaccines. That's something that could help you, not the surveillance state. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. Now, the same government that tells you they need to capture all of your personal information, store it and analyze it for your safety, of course, also is the same government that is wiping out information showing how people have been harmed by vaccines. Of course, we have a vaccine court in this country that was created back in 1986. It was done because there were so many claims against the vaccine companies. They were afraid that they would drive big pharmaceutical out of business or at least hurt its profits. So basically, if you're harmed by vaccines, you go to this vaccine court, which is essentially a judge making a single determination, not a real trial where you could get full compensation. Now, in this vaccine court, they have, as, as these cases come in, they publish the number of cases and what they're referring to. And they are now scrubbing the last couple of years of data. This is from Cheryl Atkinson. She was a reporter, of course, for mainstream media. She was an establishment reporter. She got tired of the lying going on there. She's doing her own investigation work, some good uh, investigation work here. Government wipes recent vaccine injury data from the website. They say a recent rise in vaccine victims' court decisions and concessions are not reflected in the revised government data. In March, the federal government removed the latest vaccine injury court statistics, more than a year's worth of data, from one of its publicly reported charts, it was an abrupt departure from the normal practice of updating the figures monthly. Wiping the latest data means the adjudication chart on a government website no longer reflects the recent sharp rise in court victories for plaintiffs who claim the children were seriously injured or killed by the vaccines. She says, since January of 2014, twice as many victims have won court decisions than in the previous eight years combined. Let me repeat that. Twice as many victims have won court decisions since January of 2014 than in the previous eight years combined. So we have a judge that ruled the evidence showed that vaccines are more likely than not cause the plaintiff's injuries. That's when they win the case. She says also on the rise is a number of vaccine injury cases that the government has conceded. That is up 55% in just over a year. 
And as you start to look at these charts, it is really amazing. They've scrubbed essentially uh, this, this uh, rapid rise in injuries has been scrubbed. And of course they say that's to maintain compatibility and with consistency with the CDC figures. Well, why don't the CDC figures report the data accurately, we could ask. Now we see this is not just the United States, it's also in the UK. An article that just came out today in The Independent says thousands of teenage girls enduring debilitating illnesses after routine school cancer vaccination. This, of course, is the infamous HPV uh, vaccine, which was the which uh, Rick Perry tried to mandate in Texas. They say when Karen Riles was asked to sign a consent form, oh, they actually have consent forms in the UK. That's what they don't want us to have here. We still do have informed consent, uh, and they still have it in the UK. That's what they're trying to remove, and you need to ask yourself, why we would have our informed consent removed. Why would they remove years worth of data that shows a rapid rise in the number of people who are injured by these vaccines? Well, of course they know that if you know all of this, just like if you knew what was in these secret trade partnership agreements, which are really treaties, if you really were informed, you wouldn't stand for what they're doing to you. So let me give you this particular case that they run down here. This is a lady, uh, Karen Riles, she was asked to sign consent forms so her then 13-year-old daughter, Emily, could be vaccinated against cervical cancer. Yet the past four years have turned into a nightmare for the family as Emily soon suffered side effects. Only two weeks after her first HPV injection, the teenager experienced dizziness and nausea. They say the symptoms grew increasingly worse after the second and third injections, and I went to A&E several times with severe chest and abdominal pains, as well as difficulty breathing, she said. She's now 17. One time, I couldn't move anything on one side of my body. I didn't know what was happening. Now, they say that prior to this, she was very healthy. She had an unremarkable medical history. She was also very involved in athletics. She was on the uh, hockey, netball, athletics uh, uh, team. She was a keen dancer, they say. Now, listen to the way she was re uh, received by the doctor when she went in. She said, every visit to a doctor was met with rolled eyes, said her mother. Every mention of the HPV vaccination was met with hostility with ridicule. You know, she must be some kind of a conspiracy theorist because vaccines would never harm anyone. That's the lie they want you to believe. That's the lie where they will remove the data from the vaccine court's uh, uh, published information to keep you believing that lie. She says, we were eventually referred to a local pediatrician who told her to push herself to get back to normal. Yeah, just think positive thoughts. It doesn't matter uh, what that stuff did to you that we injected with you. She says, we all feel tired in the morning, she told Emily. And that was one of the remarks regarding her complete exhaustion. Now, if you look at this chart on here, you'll see that the uh, number of people that have reported drug reactions in the UK, you see down at the bottom of the chart, the HPV, that's way higher than anything else. It's about 8,200 cases. Those are just the ones that were reported, and that was just in the UK. Following that closely is uh, influenza virus, about 3,000 there, and about 1,600 of the Mumps vaccine, the uh, measles, mumps, and rubella, the MMR, the one that we have to mandate now all over the country. Remember, because we had a couple of people, they tell us, uh, got uh, measles in Disneyland. That's why we have to take away informed consent. But, of course, that's the third highest damaging vaccine per the statistics of the U.K. Now, just as they want to force dangerous, ineffective medications on you that are very profitable, they also want to withhold things that are safe and effective but don't make any money for them, like medical marijuana. Fortunately, in Texas, we do have a medical marijuana bill. It's not much, but it is a big step in the right direction. Article up on Infowars.com, Texas marijuana legalization 2015, cannabis oil to be allowed for epilepsy treatment, says Governor Abbott. They say that uh, he is going, to, he said on Sunday, yesterday, that he will sign a bill that will legalize cannabis oil as a treatment for epilepsy. Now, this is a very, very narrow scope. Only for epilepsy. And only if you've got a doctor's prescription. And I haven't seen all of the details about how you get that, but I've heard reports that, of course, you're going to have to try all the other therapies that are offered by the big pharmaceutical companies before you will be allowed to do that. Nevertheless, there's about 150,000 people in Texas, they presume, that are suffering from epilepsy that cannot get any relief from pharmaceutical synthetic drugs. And so they are going to graciously allow them to do this. But this brings up a key question. If you have to have a prescription written by a physician, how are you going to get that considering the fact that it is against federal law 
for the physicians to prescribe this. They say Senate Bill 339 does not legalize marijuana for recreational medical use, rather specifies the single use of cannabis oil. Now, here is a key point. Of course, marijuana is a Schedule I drug, which says that there is no medical use for that drug, and it is highly addictive. That's why 80% of the people in our prison population, our, our drug prison population, and that is huge. We have more people per capita by far than any other country in the world, far more than any other country in history, and 80% of the people that are there for drug charges are there for marijuana, maintaining the fact that it is a Schedule I drug, which it clearly isn't. They have just admitted here that it is effective for epilepsy. We know it's effective for glaucoma. We know it's effective for some other things. So they're maintaining this lie that it is a Schedule I drug while allowing it for one single thing. And so you have to ask if they would have compassion for that one disease. Why wouldn't they take David Simpson's approach, a Texas legislator who offered a bill that would essentially remove marijuana from the Texas legal code? It is a natural substance. The government should not be regulating it. And the federal government has absolutely no constitutional authority to do that. That's why they created a separate amendment for alcohol. That's why we have two of those amendments in there. Now, in another related story, of course, we learned over the weekend that Joe Biden's son, Bo Biden, contracted uh, brain cancer suddenly and died over a very short period of time. It's a very sad story, and it's even sadder, I think, when we look at what we know about medical marijuana and about Joe Biden's role in keeping it off of the market, keeping it away from patients. We learned back in November, yet another study came out that marijuana kills brain cancer cells. The active molecules in cannabis kill brain cancer, says yet another study. Scientists using an extract of whole plant marijuana, rich in POTS main psychoactive ingredient, THC, as well as CBD, showed dramatic reductions in tumor volumes of a type of brain cancer. And they say marijuana kills cancer in proportion to its dose and duration of treatment, researchers found. And they found that whole plant cannabis that was rich in THC was more efficacious than pure lab-grade THC alone. Now, think about that. And then think about that in February of last year, Joe Biden came out and bragged about how he was the guy who gave us drug czars. How, in spite of the fact that they had just had an election in D.C. saying they were going to legalize marijuana, he was going to hold hard against that. Here's some of the quotes that Joe Biden said about how he approached marijuana. He said in the Senate, Biden was, uh, this is from Time Magazine, Biden was on the forefront of the Democrat Party's war on crime, he said. It's a war of drugs. Authoring or co-sponsoring legislation that created the federal drug czar and mandatory minimum sentencing for marijuana. So he's the guy that gave us our first drug czar. Remember when we had uh, William Bennett, we had our first czar. We went full on authoritarian, like uh, one of the worst Russian rulers. We took that name on. We came up with mandatory minimums. That was Ronald Reagan and Joe Biden in there, sending people to jail for a massive amount of times. So many people going to jail for so long that they had to let out violent criminals so that they could fulfill the mandatory minimum requirements of Joe Biden and Ronald Reagan. And so he says, uh, I'm not only the guy who did the crime bill and the drug czar, but I'm also the guy who spent years when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, trying to change drug policy relative to cocaine, for example, crack and powder. That was probably about the same time that uh, the government was bringing in crack cocaine to finance the Iran-Contra scandal. But isn't it sad that as, just as we saw with Dennis Hastert being hoisted by his own petard, going, he got facing jail time not because of sexual crimes that have long since passed the statute of limitation, even though he should be going to jail for that. No, if he goes to jail, it will be for structuring his cash withdrawals, something that he put in the Patriot Act, something he helped to shepherd through with the Patriot Act. And so here we see yet another one of these politicians whose family and who has personally been struck by the consequences of the evil laws that they have passed. Joe Biden's son dying, perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps he could have been helped. Perhaps his life could have been extended. Perhaps he could have even have been cured. But no, we can't have safe and effective medication. We need drug czars 
and we need mandatory minimums. Stay with us. We're going to be right back, and we're going to talk about the TPP and how easily politicians have been bought. Stay with us. As The Guardian points out, last week was the best of weeks and the worst of weeks for Dennis Hastert. Of course, he began the week by closing on a $25 billion merger between a couple of the largest tobacco companies, creating a 34% market share for the resulting company. That's what these guys do. Of course, Dennis Hastert, the rest of the politicians, just as we see with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Trans-Atlantic Partnerships, we see that what they're trying to do is consolidate ownership of everything to one or two companies. That's what all these companies are trying to do. That's their mechanism. And of course, people like Dennis Hastert, they're their guys. They're the go-to guys that they go to for this. But then, of course, by the end of the week, he had been caught in uh, something that may send him to jail for 530 years. Not the sexual assault, but the Patriot Act, structuring of cash, the war on cash, the criminalizing of cash that he put into the Patriot Act. That may wind up sending him to jail for 530 years. Now, it's interesting to look at this, of course. It's what they do. They lobby federal regulators. And they say... Uh, and, and look at the money that he's making as he's doing this, as he's creating these monopolies for various industries. They say even though he was employed as a lobbyist, he was still getting paid $40,000 per month. Per month. $40,000 per month. That's just his retirement benefits from being Speaker of the House uh, in Congress. But then, of course, he also had speaking fees. He had consultancy fees. He sat on the board of CME Group. That's the Chicago-based financial giant owns things like the entire Chicago Board of Trade. Okay, he's on the board of directors of that. What's he been doing? Well, he's been working for the government of Turkey. He's been working for big energy, for real estate interests, for spa services. <laughs> I wouldn't think that would be too large. But then, of course, big tobacco. And, of course, one of these companies that merged with Reynolds, Lorillar Tobacco, had paid him $2.6 million in 2011, 2.3 million in 2012, 2.7 million in 2013. So isn't that nice how that all worked out? He was just a high school wrestling coach. And he had a penchant for evidently sexually molesting his students. And he's pulled out of that and put into a position of authority because they can control him. And it certainly paid off handsomely. But he's not the only one, of course. We've got an article up on Infowars.com tracking how little it cost to buy congressman. He had a pretty high price, but the other guys will sell you out a lot cheaper than that. This is how little it costs Goldman Sachs to bribe America's senators in order to fast track Obama's TPP bill. And what we see here is a chart. And if you look at the chart, you'll see Goldman Sachs up at the top way more than anybody else contributing to an organization called the U.S. Business Coalition for TPP. Now, what they did was they took data from the FEC, the Federal Election Commission's, and they looked to see who was the biggest, who were the biggest contributors to this pro-TPP lobbying group. Then they looked to see who got the money. But let's first look at the contributors. We've got Goldman Sachs out there, more than two to one over the number two, which is UPS. FedEx is also pretty close up there as well. So I guess you're going to see uh, a lot more business uh, being uh, shipped uh, back and forth if they have this trade agreement. Uh, I don't know how much you get paid for shipping a job. I don't know if you ship jobs using UPS and FedEx. I think you use something else for that. But then, of course, the banks are there quite a bit, Citigroup, others. Facebook is there. And then, of course, we see media companies like Time Warner and Viacom. They say it didn't cost that much, actually. They spread the cash around. You remember at the beginning of the week, there was that filibuster from Democrats, and basically they weren't really trying to stop the bill. They're just saying you're going to have to pony up with more cash. That cash turned out to be uh, $1.1 million. They say, of the total given, an average of 17676 was donated to each of the yes votes. They say that average Republicans got 19.6. The average Democrats got $9.7,000. And it's interesting that you see a couple of the names that have really been fighting hard to stop Rand Paul on the Patriot Act. We see Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina got $60,000, because we're just talking about the averages. And then we see Chuck Grassley of Iowa got $35,000. Some others get some special mention on this. We need to remember who stood for this and who caved in for it. Now, of course, uh, in this article, one thing that they got wrong was the votes. They crossed the uh, votes up 
the people who voted to stop the filibuster, and that was unanimous for Republicans that were there. Nevertheless, when it actually came to the fast-tracked authority, there were five Republicans who stood up against this, and that was uh, Rand Paul, Pete Sessions, both of whom had actually looked at the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Most others hadn't. Also, Mike Lee stood against that, and two others stood against the leadership and stood against the fast-track authority. And, of course, the fast-tracked authority that Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Lindsey Graham, people who are running for president, the fast-track authority that they signed onto essentially lies to us, telling us that this is not a treaty, and we know full well that it is a treaty. By definition, it is a treaty. It's an agreement over commerce between one or more nations. That is a treaty. But they lie to us. They tell us that it is a trade agreement. They tell us that it is a partnership so they can get it through the Senate without the required 67 votes. So when you see a senator who signed on to this, understand that they have betrayed you at a fundamental level even before you see what's in these secretly negotiated trade agreements. But if you think the senators sold out cheap, the trade representative, the key trade representative, held out for a lot more. This is an article from Liberty Blitzkrieg, and they say uh, how Obama's top trade representative, Michael Froman, received millions from Citigroup during the financial crisis. And, of course, he's being paid very well by the people who are lobbying for this. In a press release, groups that are opposed to the TPP and the uh, TTIP highlighted the links between Citigroup, which has lobbied extensively on those, and the fast-tracked authority, and with Michael Froman, who is the U.S. trade representative, who is negotiating. He's He's taken the lead in these secret negotiations with the 400 or so corporate lobbyists that we are not allowed to see because you and I, the American public, we're not stakeholders anymore. These people own everything. They are the stakeholders. They say he received more than $4 million in a golden parachute from Citigroup upon leaving the large financial institution to join the Obama administration in 2009 and began these trade negotiations. They say no one is pushing harder to pass the multinational corporate giveaway masquerading as free trade known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, than Obama's top trade representative, Michael Froman. This is what the New York Times points out. They say he previously worked for Citigroup on the largest recipients of taxpayer bailout money. See, that's why we're saying this is not free trade. This is crony capitalism. This is written by the same banks and the same big corporations that benefited from the bailouts, especially the banks. This is a guy who got millions as part of that bailout, and now he is doing it again. And that's precisely what is going on with this. This is nothing but crony capitalism for the benefit of a few, selling your jobs, exporting your jobs, and importing workers. They say, noting deep ties between the country's top trade negotiator and Wall Street banks, 10 groups that represent millions of Americans are calling on the White House to make public all communications between the U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman and the massive financial institutions that stand to benefit from proposed trade deals. Well, good luck with that. We can't get the emails of Hillary Clinton. We can't see what the IRS is doing to people. We can't see the trade agreement. We can certainly ask and we can point out that uh, this is something that is being done in secret, but I don't think we're going to see the secretive emails between the trade representative, former Citigroup uh, official who got millions after the bank bailouts. Now, next week, we're going to have uh, the beginning of the Bilderberg meeting. If you want to talk about people who are planning the economic downfall of the West, uh, go to the Bilderberg meeting and see who is in attendance there. And, of course, we do that every year. This year, we're going to have Paul Joseph Watson again. Rob Dew will be going, as will Josh Owens. That will be next week. And to give you an idea and uh, some background on that, let's take a look at this report from John Bowne. I continue to be much more concerned when it comes to our security with the prospect of uh, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan. The Bilderberg Group will coalesce June 9th through the 14th in the Austrian mountains at the Inner Alpen Hotel. How many of these instigators of widespread tyranny will be discussing their million dollar safe bunkers between meetings as they hide like moles while their hellish plans are unleashed on the gullible masses? It's called a panic room. What? A safe room. Castle keep in medieval times. Fort concrete walls, buried phone line not connected to the house's main line. You have your own ventilation system and a bank of surveillance monitors that covers nearly every corner of the house. What's to keep someone from prying open the door? Steel. Very thick steel. 
A decade ago, safe rooms would only have been of interest to A-list celebrities who wanted to protect against stalkers, but they are now becoming popular with elites who wish to guard against potential civil unrest which could cause crime rates to skyrocket in the aftermath of an economic collapse. According to a New York Times report, the typically 8 feet by 12 feet bulletproof rooms are an increasingly sought after means of the elite feeling protected just as moats and armies protected them in centuries past. Wealthy individuals, including foreigners who are more familiar with such stringent security measures, are having safe rooms installed to protect their personal possessions, as well as their own physical safety, against potential domestic disorder that could arise out of sudden economic collapse. This huge disparity is not because of some flaw in capitalism or because of the Reagan tax cuts or even the greed of Wall Street. The problem is central banks that are out of control, printing money like no one ever imagined, and have created a massive worldwide financial inflation. And when you have a financial inflation, the people that own the stocks and the bonds get the windfall. After 9-11, he got requests for one or two safe rooms a year. But that number has recently jumped to more than 20 rooms annually. Probably do about 25 this year, did about 21, 22 last year. But we're looking at possibly it going up to maybe 30 the following year. So we just see an increase every year. The notion that the elite are making preparations for mass civil disorder is no conspiracy theory. Fearing global unrest and the possibility of another major conflict, Many members of the elite have been buying remote property and land in places like New Zealand. A lot of very wealthy and powerful people are quite afraid right now. They see us on an unstable trajectory. They don't see our political institutions being what you might call representative, responsive, and pulling things together. Things are getting more and more dangerous as, say, Ferguson, Missouri, brings to bear. Ironically, Johnson is president of the Institute of New Economic Thinking, an organization founded and bankrolled by billionaire George Soros, who himself is funding the very same movement aggravating the civil unrest, the Black Lives Matter movement. These two men, Frederick Young and Philando Hunter, were sentenced on this day to life in prison without parole for robbing, torturing, murdering the two teens who had been in Detroit trying to buy drugs. i like to say sorry to the families of Ayanna Jones, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and I want to apologize to them for not being able to get justice for their loved ones who was murdered in cold blood. And in respect for the peaceful protest, I want to say hands up, don't shoot, Black Lives Matter. The risk of domestic disorder is also heightened by the fact that distrust in government and leadership in the United States and other Western countries continues to remain near historic lows. Corruption, social alienation, and lack of community, all of which were contributing factors to the 2011 London riots, are all creating a powder keg situation that could blow at any moment. The United States government's inability to fund social programs could also lead to the seizure of private pension funds. The euro, the creation of the euro, was all about not creating a strong Europe, but it was because he's not European, he's uh, Canadian American. Uh, it was about making sure that nation, that each nation would no longer have control of its own fiscal fate, that they would be stuck competing against each other by reducing services and uh, provided by the government. So that you, you keep cheapening your workforce. And he was very blunt about it. He said, that's the purpose of it. It's, it's not to make Europe stronger. It's to make the nations within Europe uh, impotent. And that was his philosophy. That that uh, you know. So, you and know. that's the same thing with NAFTA and GATT. Ross Perot was right. The race to the bottom, and we got the SPP North American Union documents three years ago when Judicial Watch sued and got them. And they said they had all these corporate chiefs there at the governmental meeting, telling the Secretary of State of Mexico, Canada, uh, and the United States what to do. And they said we're going to lower the U.S. and Canada to the level of Mexico just as we've done with the euro so there's nowhere to run nowhere to compete and 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 now we're going to play nations off against each other all over the world asia european union north american union to basically get all the tax money for bankers as bailouts and take people's pension funds and now we see bloomberg reporting that federal regulators are preparing to take at least half of people's pensions in the u.s
As real wages drop, it will also become increasingly harder to pacify younger generations via consumer culture. Lifestyles built around the acquisition of products will become harder to maintain as the economic environment worsens. These factors, when combined with further police brutality and a growing sense of injustice, almost guarantee to cause more civil unrest over the next two years. Fulfilling economist Martin Armstrong's prediction that a serious political uprising will erupt by 2016 in the United States. John Bound for Infowars.com.